Hello and welcome to Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides and with me is Mr. Chris Hellstrom as always. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing good, Jody. How about yourself? I am feeling bouncy today. It's going to be a long 36 hours, I think. All right. Hopefully very productive as well. <laughs> yes, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yes. Well, you were telling me off camera about an interesting opportunity that that's going to come up and I am waiting for the email that's going to direct me in the direction I'm supposed to go in regards to that opportunity. And I'm not going to talk about it any further than that now. Well, I wish you all the best. Thank you, sir. All right. Today, we are going to do something a little different, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes, we, uh, are. we are. Do you want to tell them or should I tell them or uh, should we just not tell them? Rochambeau <laughs> for it. <laughs> One, two, three. Do we both get a two? <laughs> yeah, we did. Damn it. All right. You, you, you do it. I'll kick it you off. You do it. All right. We are, today, we are going to discuss an album that has influenced well, more myself than it has Chris, but an album that has been influential in the recording and production world that may or may not be so well known. And that album today is... Spilt Milk. There you go. Spilt Milk. Jellyfish. Jellyfish. If you are not familiar with the band called The Jellyfish or just Jellyfish, you've got a real problem in life and it needs to be solved. Go to your nearest <laughs> streaming service and stream Spilt Milk. Or start with their first album, Belly Button, because they did release two albums in their short but illustrious career. And the first one is Belly Button. The second one was Spilt Milk. There is a box set that you can get that I don't believe is actually online on any streaming service. <sighs> And I'm so happy that I own it. It is everything that they've ever done, whether it's live or recorded or in demos for themselves or for anyone else. Yes, That's I am cool. a jellyfish nut. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds a little bit like you're really into this band, huh? No, not at all. Not at all. Well, let's start um, from the beginning. Um, the beginning? Well, let's see. They were born. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean the beginning of you being turned on to this band. Uh, so, yes. uh, so you said that this was a roommate that kind of turned you on to this. At some well, point. I haven't said it on the podcast, but yes, uh, beforehand we were talking about how did I learn about the jellyfish. I was living with an infamous singer, otherwise known as Jeff Scott Soto, who is famous for having sung with such illustrious musicians as Ingve J. Malmsteen. And he has his own band as well called Talisman. He did another band called Human Clay. He had something called Slam for a while. He has another project now called Wet. He has his own solo thing, Jeff Scott Soto. He sings for Trans-Siberian Orchestra. He sings for a lot of different people. Sons um, of Apollo. Sons of Apollo is another big thing he's doing right now. With a, It's like a super group of progressive rock kind of stuff. Yes. Uh, in addition to that, he has sung for numerous other things, including movies like uh, Rockstar starring Mark Wahlberg. He is the voice of the singer that got kicked out of the band. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, other movies as well. Plus, he did some things for other artists as their vocalist, too. Yeah. So, yeah, he's a pretty well-known, well-regarded vocalist who is a good friend of mine. He is the one that introduced me to Jellyfish. Yeah. And um, as far as, like, time period-wise, we're talking now early 90s. Correct? Well, that's not when I found out about him, but yes. That's when they came out. So when, when did they come on your radar? They came onto my radar in the late 90s. Late 90s. Late 90s. Um, yeah, it's kind of the later 90s, somewhere probably around 96. I don't know. It's, it's, the years are blurry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they do get blurry young, after a while. Young, but... blurry dumbness. I don't know. It was a while yeah. back. It was in the late mid to late 90s, yes. Right. But it, it, it is just that is kind of interesting because uh, they their debut came out in 1990. Yes, it did. And the album that we're talking about now, Spilt Milk, came out in 93. 93, Yes. So for, unless you're, you know, you're too young to remember, um, the- Grunge explosion. Point, yeah. Grunge, grunge like explosion. Nirvana. So at this, 
Right. So Boom. it was Nirvana. And it was just the sound garden, Pearl Jam, the sound and garden. all this kind of thing. So, Stone Temple um, Pilots. Yeah. So that had firmly planted itself in in the popular culture at that point. So yes. an album like this didn't was yes didn't it, it get was, the recognition that it deserved. <laughs> right. And so that's why presumably by you know, rabbit fans knew about them and turned people like you onto them. Yes. Well, uh, it, here's another fun thing. And just regarding it's like turning people onto things. Uh, there's another Chris that I've been mentoring as of late, and he had no idea who the jellyfish were. I had to sit him down and, <laughs> and say, hey, you want to get into production? You need to know this album. Uh, girlfriends who don't know yeah. jellyfish, they get schooled or indoctrinated <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know what the proper term for that is but yes <laughs> get the fuck out of my house <laughs> you will you will not ride in my car and not know who the jellyfish are <laughs> yeah might as well sit down because this is happening this now is, we're yes, listening this to is, this now this is this is what's going to happen on this particular road trip yep. yeah so um what was it that really struck a chord in you when you're you were exposed to this the first time. I I was coming off of uh, an intense love of Queen. Yeah. I had been introduced to Queen at music school. Right. And it was almost like a natural extension of Queen. In addition to that, it was like a natural extension of Wings and the Beatles, which my parents were really into. And so growing up around the house, there was – things like Paul McCartney and wings being played along with things like the cars. So all hmm. of this kind of stuff kind of culminates in the jellyfish. If you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because when I, when I listened to it, I had to, I was aware of them, but I wasn't a super fan like you. Well, I don't uh, know if I'm a total super fan, but I'm definitely a fan. I'm going to call you a super fan. <laughs> you got all the demos. You're a super fan. Yeah, I guess. That's um, true. But uh, the thing that leaps out at me is that it has this sort of um, Beatle esque quality. To yes, it, it does. And I, you know, I think myself included, probably we use that term a lot to kind of describe something that is just well done. Well, what but, other but band in history, in terms of pop culture, has had such a gigantic influence on what came after? This is true. I yeah. mean, the Beatles yeah. kind of culminate as like a turning point in popular culture, period. Right. And they were around for less than 10 years. Yeah, it's crazy. As a recording. That, that's pretty crazy. But anyway, so it has this sort of quality in the songwriting and the aesthetic, I would say, mm -hmm. a little bit. That, that it's, and when I say Beatles, I, I tend to think about uh, more of the, the later stage Beatles, like the more experimental, the Sgt. Pepper, the yeah. that, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's not the early um, stage Beatles, definitely late stage Beatles. Right. So it has this sort of very experimental thing. <laughs> and um, I think you mentioned Queen, and I think it is a very good sort of a cross between Beatles and Queen. Yes. In the way that this album sounds. Yeah. Well, and also if you're familiar with Wings. It's a definite extension sure. of that too. So it's like a combination of all that poppy rock stuff, right? But they they go even further into the explorations of all of that, including pulling in other genres beyond just pop and rock, but like big band and circus type music. That's a good way to say. It. So there's circus value to it, and in addition to that, there's some jazz as well that gets in there. So it's they really pulled a lot of influences together when they created their sound. Yeah. And the thing that, um, at least to me, jumps out, and I think you, you you probably agree with me, that when you listen to it, 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 it doesn't feel like it's disjointed, even though it has all of these elements. They no, somehow not make all. it work. Yeah, you know? they make it all work. It's an awful lot like Queen, how Queen did so many different things, but it all sounded like Queen. Jellyfish, same way. They did so many different things in terms of their albums and their song to song and even parts within songs, yet it all sounds perfectly aligned for what it's supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, no it sounds very cohesive. It's this, it's this big blob of music that just works together, you know? Yeah. And, uh, 
It's a good yeah. way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Blob. <laughs> giant blob. A giant blob. So um, the, the songwriting and the songs were what leapt out of you first. Now, oh, fast forward melodies, to- Melodies, really. First thing. Melodies. melodies. And then getting into, like, I, I knew all the words and I knew all the lyrics, but I never put the two and two of, like, the reasoning behind some of the lyrics together. Uh-huh. So- yeah, I mean, if we start breaking down individual songs, I can start talking about some of that stuff. But it's like, if you knew the actual meaning behind the words, sometimes it just it's a lot of it's tongue in cheek. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, some of it would actually blow your mind when you realize, oh wow, that's what he's singing about. Interesting. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Then we'd have to do this like a ten episode arc here to talk about. <laughs> Might. Yeah. Uh, and we're not going to do that. No. So no worries. But no, no, go no. listen to the album. Um, so beyond that, let's fast forward to today, past sort of like the songwriting from mm. um, the sound of the album. Mm -hmm. Is How do you think that has found its way into sort of like your aesthetic today when it comes to your production? And, and It's very, very clean, very clean. Almost all the instrumentation, unless it's like really buried volume wise you can hear all the different pieces pretty much going on that are happening on the record like every instrument has a reason and every instrument can pretty much be heard for that reason yeah and that to me just shows the amount of oh dedication the the willful intention the willful yeah. intention of what they meant when they were doing everything that they did and that is something that oftentimes i feel like is missing even with the most grandiose of modern productions now it still feels like a lot of the time the intent is not yeah. there it's just yeah. let's throw this spaghetti in here and let's just throw it out and see what sticks that's not how they approached it all the people that worked on this album approached it for a very particular, they were sought out for particular reasons. They worked on it for particular, everybody was very particular. Yeah. Is my understanding on how they dealt with all of this stuff, which is why it, I think it works as well as it does. Yeah. No, it's very, I think. Um, and that has... and in terms of like how I approach producing and how I do my sonicness, the sonicness that I tend to have is very much along those lines. Everything has to have an intent of why it is there. And it, I, and if it's there, it should necessarily be heard because there's an intent for it to be there. Yeah. So that's, I so, think that answers the question. Yeah. No, I think we, we talked about that in an earlier episode as well. We talked about arrangements and, um, Listening to an album like this, it is really well arranged. Oh, because, ridiculous. Cause, yeah, because when you say clean, and also th that doesn't mean that there's a complete lack of distortion or, or overdrive or anything on this album, but it is the thing that speaks to me or, or the thing that I noticed first is that just what you describe, everything has its place and you can pick up everything. Not everything is up front, but no. there's also not a whole lot of stuff that's buried. That, that right. sounds like it, it shouldn't work together, but but it does. It, it does. It, and uh, it's interesting. It's definitely one of those headphone albums that you you know you sit down and, and uh, listen to. But you could also have it on in the background and just have it being sort of like great pop songs type of thing. So and that's uh, around. Yeehaw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, so. Um, talked about that anything well maybe we should go into who, who was part of this album maybe you can tell us a little bit more about who who actually the personnel of the band that type the thing. two main guys that mm -hmm. really kind of created the vibe and created the songs is andy Sturmer and roger manning those okay. are the two mastermind geniuses beside behind the songwriting for the most okay. part and Beyond that, let's take a quick moment to thank our sponsors. And so beyond Andy Sturmer and Roger Manning, uh, the people that are in the studio, um, they were Albie, I think that's the, pronounce, the correct pronounce, Albie Glauten. 
Gla- Galutin, Albi Galutin. That's a strange name. And then the other big name that maybe as a producer or a mixing engineer you're going to recognize is Jack Joseph Puig. And the reason why you might recognize that is because he has done some plug-in suites with some famous plug-in manufacturers or software creators. And uh, people tend to use his plugins for doing various recording and mixing purposes. So, He's also had a quite illustrious career as yes. a producer as well. So, <laughs> but this was like his. This was kind of his beginning. Yeah, he was. He was the underling that was kind of thrown at this. Is is my understanding? Now, I could be wrong, but uh, it was like he was given the reins to do this, and he really went and did it. I mean, they really yeah. like they did it. So, because yeah, you think about it, I mean, ninety three. This is almost thirty years ago, which is mind boggling when you look back. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're 2020 right now. So, yeah. yeah. It's crazy years. Uh, so, those were the four guys as producers. Albie, mm-hmm. Galutin, Jack Joseph Puig, Andy Sturmer, and Roger Manning. So, both yeah. Andy and Roger took reins in terms of coming up with how the production was going to work, in addition to having to the head and producer engineer Jack Joseph Puig and Albi Galutin. So yeah. yeah, those are like the four guys that kind of really define the sound on the album. And it's and Jack Joseph Puig also worked with them on Belly Button as well, their first album. Hmm. So yeah. Very so those cool. are like those are like the masterminds behind the sound. In terms of like the writing and the songs and the lyrics and everything, that was Andy and Roger. And occasionally, uh, it was also, I think another guy involved in some of the writing may have been Tim Smith or was it Roger's brother? Uh, There's another guy that's who had some inclination on some of the song, but he may have only been on belly button because I think he quit after the belly button album and tour. Um, So, yeah, but in terms of like, just like the intensity of what they did in terms of the songs, uh, most people are sitting there thinking they're going to bang out tunes in like a matter of an hour in an afternoon. And then like, they're going to record it in an hour and like, they're done. Yeah. Um, that is well, not that, how Andy and Roger worked. <laughs> yeah, no, that's certain. That works for some people. And sometimes you do your best work that way, but not all the time. And this right. was not one of those times. Right. So no, um, not at all. So, so how much time did they spend on this? Five months just on writing the songs. Five yeah. months of time writing, uh, I think, with all the demos and, and what made the album, I think you're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 tunes in five months. And while that might seem like a short, well, a long time to some people, that's not necessarily a long time for that many songs of this kind of caliber because they're yeah. all really really damn good (laughs) it's like they're like all just i mean there's not a bad song on the album that's what's crazy (laughs) yeah that's that's kind of rare when when that happens um you said you have the demos and all that kind of stuff i do have like from the box set they have like additional demos not only of the songs that made the album in demo form but other songs that didn't make the album they have demos of those too that you can find so how do they differ from the final product on the album? Most of the demos are done in bass, drums, keyboards, if there's guitar, and vocals for the most part. And then maybe like Roger might have had some samples for keyboard stuff where they would lay in the ideas of some of the things like for horns or other stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Because... Like I said, the, the listening to this, you hear is they're bless you. Mm. These are very, very dense tracks, right? And very mm-hmm. well arranged. So um my curiosity would be there, how much of that do you think was experimentation uh, experimentation? That's easy for you to say. <laughs> experimentation in the studio and perhaps under the influence of Albi or or, or Jack. Jack. Uh... Um where if those were there and they were just like, you know, because we're, we're, again, we're talking early 90s. This is at the beginning of DAWs. So this was probably demoed on going to a studio and cutting demos or even like 
Tascam, eight track at yeah, home. Tascam eight track, probably ported studio type demos. You know, I don't know. I've not actually looked into how they did the demos, and I do know that um, they did a combination of processes where they recorded to tape, but they also transferred things into computer to do some editing. So they did a combination of both. Yeah, and that could very well be how it worked out for the demos too. But it, my guess is, is maybe the demos are done on a, you know, task and Porta studio type things, the 688 or something. I don't know. Um, right. Haven't gone quite that far into that depth, but what I do know is that Roger used to spend uh, entire days every day, six, seven days a week, five months at a time going over to uh, Andy's house to write mm -hmm. and record and tweak and rewrite and tweak and rewrite and tweak and rewrite and tweak and demo and tweak. So they spent a good deal of time just working on the songs and it was eight hour days from nine to, or yeah, I guess nine to nine or however you work it out with you take your breaks and you, you go, you're starting your breakfast, you go, you do your work, take a lunch break and you go back and you continue to work until it's time for dinner. And then you continue on, go home, go sleep, get up and do it again the next day for five months straight every day. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's true songwriting dedication and it shows in the songs. That's what's so ridiculous about it is, is people wonder, well, why isn't my song getting the same kind of attention? Well, here's a guy that, or a group of guys that wrote some ridiculously amazing songs, almost hit that stardom quality and mm -hmm. still didn't make it, even with some of the greatest songs ever written in terms of just sheer awesomeness. <laughs> yeah. No, it's easy to get... Um sort of bummed out about that but but that's that's ultimately things that you can't control you right. know let the music landscape changes and what's popular yeah, the one zeitgeist year isn't it's yeah, all you, about the zeitgeist and if you don't and, hit um, it you don't hit it yeah so. and well i think it's important to be aware of that ultimately you you have to be you right mm, you have yes. to do what what you do and i think that's what you end up doing uh the best Ultimately. Correct. So, um, so after their five months of writing, they spent four months demoing the songs. Wow. That's a long time. I mean, that's nine months just on pre-production of an album. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. who does albums anymore, right? So that's almost a month per song, so to yeah. speak. Right. Yeah. That, that, yeah. It's, uh, I, I can I say it again, but it's a pretty dense album <laughs> when, when you listen to it. any specific tracks that that are favorites for you. I mean, you said you like all the tracks, but but anything that let's say for anybody that wants to, you're going to impress your friend here by playing him jellyfish. And, and what what's the first track you go to by playing in the jellyfish or by playing, no, playing that for somebody? Yeah, oh, man. Um, yeah, I. I Wow, that's really hard to say because it really might come down to what mood are they in? Because there's so many different moods across the entire album mm -hmm. and across their entire career that it almost helps to start with the mood that the person's in. Um, but, you know, if you're going straight down the track list, the first actual song song is joining a fan club. So yeah. uh, had, I guess you start right there on that particular album, unless you want to start on Hush, which is kind of like a lullaby that interestingly enough uh if you listen to the end of their first album belly button it mm -hmm. fades out on a vocal arrangement that hush that fades in the album of spilt milk is the completion of hmm. okay so there's there was an obvious obvious intent from the end of the uh first album to go to the beginning of the second album and then even more intent the end of the second album at the end of the last song it fades out going off on an, another variation of the vocal arrangement of hush which so. presumably would have been album number three kind of yeah thing. something like that yeah sure yeah cool all right so you're saying that there's no bad tracks so just jump in and and uh if you're going to check them out, just start from the top and let it go. And if you got like an hour to kill, put some headphones on and ease back and, and, and listen to it, I guess. Yes. You yes. will not do yourself wrong. Very cool. 
by listening to the whole thing from front to back in a dark room with your eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Remember when listening to music used to be an activity, right? Yes. It um, is an activity album. Yeah. Um, well, that's good. So, okay. So amazing songs, great um, production, engineering, great arrangements. Yes. Well, uh, let's think about how they got to that point for a moment, because how yes. much time did they actually spend in the studio recording this wonderful sonic cheesecake of yumminess that you get? Um <laughs> That was an interesting uh, comparison there. Uh, six months they spent in the studio, day in, day out, every day yeah. working. Well, my assumption is every day. I don't know if it was like the writing process, but maybe it was six days a week. Um, six months of recording, part after part yeah. after part, piece after piece after piece. Everything was, you know, they spent time getting their sounds to make sure that the sounds were just awesome. And that's that. It's kind of interesting because obviously you spend a lot of time not only on the writing but but the pre production and doing demos and things, which presumably means that they felt that things could still be improved upon when they were tracking. Yes. Because if it was one of those things where you just okay, boom, we got this, we're gonna go in like first Black Sabbath album, we're gonna go in and out in twenty four hours or whatever it was, <laughs> right? Um, Obviously, very, very different. Aesthetic, very different. Different album here. But um, my research says that they worked six days a week on it. It could have actually been seven days a week. And it was full days of recording as well. So they spent <clears throat> an awful lot of time getting the sounds right before actually tracking anything, which is something that it seems like a lot of times now everybody's in such a hurry. They don't spend quality time getting the actual sounds prior to putting them in a recording. Yeah. So right. that, I think that was a big part of it is like you get, there was a point and maybe it still happens, I think for a lot of things now, just maybe not in the same time frames anymore where they would spend a week getting drum sounds or a week getting guitar sounds. So <laughs> that kind of concept I think has kind of gone out the window. I don't think many people do that anymore. Right. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, I think it uh, today it's um, it's a little bit more rare to have a budget to be able to afford that. Right. You go in and you actually do some experimentation at, even though with all the pre-production that they did, that like you said, the things can still get improved upon. Right. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, when you have a so, better quality room that you're recording in and better quality gear that you're recording on, yeah, it takes time to get that stuff set up and get it, you know, where everybody's going to feel good about what they're doing. And right. that goes back to us talking about making the musicians feeling comfortable in the studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of that. In and, previous and episodes. Pushed and, yeah. And stimulated and, and all that kind of stuff as well. So, um, I think you told me before that there are there were also session players involved in this as well. Yeah, there were multiple session players. Uh, just kind of running down the list here in terms of like Andy Sturmer on the record ended up doing vocals. He played drums, played guitar, played keyboards. So he did a good portion of work. Roger Manning, right. his cohort in everything, was the main keyboard player, piano player, and also did vocals as well. They had uh, Tim Smith, who played bass and also did some vocals. Then they had Lyle Workman playing guitar. They had John Bryan on guitar on some songs. Uh, a guy by the name of Tom T-Bone Wolk played some bass on some of the album, uh, as well as Bruce Caphan, who played pedal steel. And Bruce actually comes from another band, but I can't remember the name of that band off the top of my head, but it was another big band. Uh, yeah. that people would recognize the name of. And then John Clark is the last person that I've listed who played some woodwinds. And then they had other players too, but I don't know who they all are. Um, that came in, they were hired to come in and play particular instruments on songs. And that was their thing. They came in, they were given a direction and boom, then hit record and see what come out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, no, it's, it's and pretty, there's, uh... there is an interesting story for one of the songs um, where in the editing process because they were given the tracks off of the tape and brought into a computer to do some editing. Hmm. 
uh, Andy in a late night editing session of trying to get something done from one track to another accidentally erased the beginning of one of Lyle Workman's guitar solos. Uh Oh, and he was distraught over it, but Jack Joseph Puig comes in and just says, Nope, that makes it better. Let's not even worry about it. That's where the guitar solo should have come in. Anyway, the extraneous notes in the beginning aren't necessary. So it worked out. It was one of those happy accidents. Um, but yeah, good. It's just yeah. when you have somebody editing on a computer system before the DAW systems were really like what they are today, yeah, there was issues. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very, very unfortunate. Uh, I want to touch on something real quick that I think speaks kind of volumes to what kind of album this is. Yes, and that's when you mentioned the session players. You mentioned the guy who plays woodwinds. And another guy that plays pedal steel. Yes. So uh, outside of the sort of air quote, normal bound setup, uh, that that's quite telling, I think, you know, because you think, well, we got to have some woodwinds and we got to have pedal steel in there. So it, it's really, um, I think, quite uh, descriptive of what kind of album this is with all the sort of, for want of a better phrase, but eclectic elements that are there as well. Yes, there are definitely a lot of different uh, instrumental paint strokes would be a good right. way of saying them. Right. There are a lot so, of them. Yeah. So um, to somewhat wrap up today's episodes, and I, we would both obviously encourage people to go check this album out. Um, yes, get on your favorite streaming service and go listen to Spilt Milk. I mean, there is it will do you a world of good as a producer. To yeah, hear the yeah. sheer shining perfection of what they have created. Right, right. And even if it's not your type of music, of you can always learn something from it, right? There's always uh, a mindset or a workflow thing that, that you can adapt into your work. So whether you're into Norwegian death metal or, well, maybe not, but uh, <laughs> uh, that, in, but if even if you're sort of like a beat maker or, you are doing more sort of on the rock ed of, of the spectrum kind of thing. You can still pull from this and, and the aesthetic and the uh, sort of like the, the work ethic and the attention to detail and all that kind of stuff to, to bring that into. That's the real big thing. Well. And then also the, the sheer lyric writing in terms of what they achieved with the lyrics some yeah. of the stuff is very tongue in cheek, as I said before, and it's some of it is also very straight ahead. And but all of the lyrics really have a, a unique flow of how they work with the melody and how the words go, and and then how they stack the harmonies to work with that stuff. It's really amazing stuff. Very cool. Very cool. All right, so go check out Jellyfish, uh, both their albums, milk. but today was. Talked about spit milk. Yes. All right, Jody. Uh, thanks for sharing all that with us. Uh, sure I'm going to let you run and wrap it up. And thank you all for listening. Have a good day, everyone. And have a good day out there and inside the recording studio land. We'll see you next week.